Greetings, I'm the man behind the mask, and I would like to talk to you about hockey. Yes, let's talk about hockey, the show that journeys through the history of the sport of ice hockey from its disputed origins to the game we see today. Now, when we last left off, Lord Stanley of Preston, the Governor General of Canada, had just purchased a silver punch bowl for slightly less than $50 to donate as a trophy for Canada's top-ranking amateur ice hockey team. Originally inscribed as the Dominion Hockey Challenge Cup, the trophy was awarded for the first time on May 15, 1893 to the Montreal Hockey Club, who were the league champions of the Amateur Hockey Association of Canada and had recently become affiliated with the Montreal Amateur Athletic Association. Though the Montreal Hockey Club formed the basis of the team, the engraving on the cup named the Montreal Amateur Athletic Association as the winner. Because of this, the Montreal Hockey Club in fact refused the awarding of the cup unless they were the acknowledged winner. The Montreal Amateur Athletic Association, however, accepted the trophy, but with none of the officials that ran the hockey club present. Even though the players were later placated by gifts, most notably rings engraved MHC, recognizing their achievement, the next few months saw a gradual split between the athletic association and the club. So much so that when the hockey club was awarded the cup again the following year, in 1894, the inscription on the cup only stated Montreal, instead of the name for either organization. Prior to the introduction of Lord Stanley's Challenge Cup, the Amateur Hockey Association of Canada was the only major hockey league in existence. However, the 20 years following the first awarding of the Stanley Cup would see 11 new major hockey leagues formed. Little known today is that the first among the new leagues to spring up over these years was the Colored Hockey League, or CHL, an all-black league founded in Nova Scotia in 1895, which featured teams from across Canada's maritime provinces and would last until 1925. With as many as a dozen teams, over 400 African-Canadian players from across Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island participated in competition. The CHL is actually credited as being the first league to allow the goaltender to leave their feet to cover the puck. In the book, Black Ice, The Lost History of the Colored Hockey League of the Maritimes, historians George and Darrell Fosty also claim that the first player to use the slap shot was Eddie Martin of the Halifax Eurekas 100 years ago. The 17 years following the creation of the CHL from 1896 to 1912 would see many different mergers and failures of different hockey leagues that competed for the Stanley Cup. This period of time is known as the Challenge Cup period. It was named this because there were so many different leagues during this time period and no dominant league. So, if a team wanted to play for the Stanley Cup, they would first need to be deemed a worthy challenger by a group of Stanley Cup trustees. Then, if determined to be worthy, they would play a challenge match against the reigning Stanley Cup champions. Prior to 1912, challenges could take place at any time during the season, and it was common for teams to defend the Cup numerous times during a single year. This is why in some years there were multiple Stanley Cup winners. It was also possible for a team in the same league as the current Stanley Cup champion to become the new champion by winning their league's title against the defending Stanley Cup champion. They would then have to defend their new title in a challenge match. During this era, hockey leagues would come and go. One of the most notable was the International Professional Hockey League, which formed in 1904. Prior to this season, Leagues in Canada fought against the professionalization of athletics. In fact, in 1902, Jack Gibson, along with his teammates, were all banned from amateur play by the Ontario Hockey Association for accepting a silver dollar as a token of the town of Berlin, Ontario's appreciation for their league championship. 
So in 1904, Gibson responded to this banishment by organizing the International Professional Hockey League, the first full-fledged professional hockey league around. The IPHL was a five-team circuit, which included Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, Calumet, Michigan, and Houghton, Michigan. Though it would only last from 1904 to 1907, the IPHL was instrumental in changing the nature of top-level senior men's ice hockey from amateur to professional. The other notable leagues that popped up in this era were the Western Pennsylvania Hockey League, a Pittsburgh-based league that lasted from 1896 to 1910, the Federal Amateur Hockey League, a league formed for the teams that were not accepted by the Canadian Amateur Hockey League, lasting from 1904 to 1909. The Timiskami Professional Hockey League, founded in 1906 around the Lake Timiskami area and lasting until 1911. The Ontario Professional Hockey League, Canada's first fully professional league, lasting from 1908 to 1911. The National Hockey Association, formed in 1909 and featuring the newly formed hockey club, the Montreal Canadiens. And the Pacific Coast Hockey Association, which formed in 1912. Aside from these new leagues, the face of the first league that challenged for the cup, the Amateur Hockey Association of Canada, would change numerous times. The Amateur Hockey Association of Canada was reformed into the Canadian Amateur Hockey League in 1898. Then that league dissolved in 1905, and four of its teams combined with two teams that broke off from the Federal Amateur Hockey League and formed the Eastern Canada Amateur Hockey Association in 1906. Three seasons later, the Eastern Canada Amateur Hockey Association would dissolve as well, and three of the teams from that league would form the Canadian Hockey Association in 1909. But that league would only survive a few weeks of play in January 1910 before teams left the league, causing its dissolution. The leagues, however, were not the only things that changed about hockey during this time. In 1900, the CAHL would first introduce the concept of using a goal net instead of the two poles stuck in the ice. These were first seen about five years earlier when a U.S. ice polo team came north from Illinois for a series of games in Ontario. The 1900 season would also see veteran referee Fred Waghorn introduce the practice of referees dropping the puck for faceoffs. Prior to Waghorn's innovation, the puck was placed on the ice by the referee, who then had to make certain each center was lined up correctly. However, this often led to sticks in tender areas of the referee's anatomy. Waghorn, however, decided to simply drop the puck, allowing them to do as they darn well pleased, he would say. In the 1910-1911 season, the format of the game would change from two 30-minute halves to the three 20-minute periods we have today. Then, for the 1911-1912 season, it was decided that players would now wear numbers on their uniforms. When the PCHA formed in 1912, it not only introduced the blue lines that divided the rink into three zones, but also allowed forward passing in the neutral zone. Despite the chaos of the ever-changing leagues and the new innovations to the game, there were only a select few teams that would capture the Stanley Cup. The team that held on to the cup the longest during this era was the Ottawa Hockey Club, which would later be renamed the Ottawa Senators. But between March 10, 1903 and March 17, 1906, they were known as the Ottawa Silver Seven, mainly because once they claimed the title of Stanley Cup champions in 1903, they held on to it until the Montreal Wanderers finally were able to beat them in a challenge match in 1906. The club would regain the Stanley Cup title two more times, from March 1909 to March 1910, and again from March 1911 to March 1912, but their first reign as champions was definitely their longest as well as their most well-known. One of the key factors to the length of this team's first championship was Frank McGee, a center and a rover who despite having sight in only one eye, was one of the best goal scorers of the time. One of his greatest feats came in January of 1905 when he scored an astounding 14 goals in Game 2 of a challenge match against the Dawson City Nuggets from the Yukon Territory, helping Ottawa to a 23-2 win. Following Ottawa's defeat in 1906, the team that beat them, the Montreal Wanderers, went on to form a Stanley Cup dynasty of their own. Though they lost the Stanley Cup to the Kenora Thistles, 
a team from the small Manitoba Professional Hockey League in January of 1907, they would win it back two months later and hold on to it until March of 1909, when Ottawa reclaimed the title from them. Two of the biggest stars from this dynasty were the rough-and-tough defenseman Art Ross, who first played as a ringer for the Kenora Thistles during their two-month stint as Stanley Cup champions before signing with the Wanderers, and Lester Patrick, who captained the Wanderers as a rover and defenseman during this championship reign and would later go on to found the PCHA with his brother Frank. By 1912, after the many mergers and failures, the multitude of major hockey leagues that competed for the Stanley Cup was narrowed down to just two, the National Hockey Association and the Pacific Coast Hockey Association. During the next couple of years, the Stanley Cup Challenge system would see one more short dynasty in the form of the NHA's Quebec Bulldogs from March of 1912 to March of 1914. The Bulldogs were led by legendary center Joe Malone, whose speed on the ice earned him the nickname Phantom Joe. During the 1912-1913 season, Phantom Joe went on to score 43 goals in just 20 games, giving him a scoring average of over two goals per game, an accomplishment that no other player has ever matched. At the start of the 1914-1915 season, the challenge system for the Stanley Cup was dropped, and a World Series system similar to Major League Baseball, where the champions from the NHA would play the champions from the PCHA for the Stanley Cup, was adopted. The first team to win under this format was the PCHA's Vancouver Millionaires, led by talented Frederick Wellington Taylor, or Cyclone Taylor to the hockey community, a man who several years earlier, while playing on a different team, announced that he would skate backward through the entire Ottawa Senators team and score a goal, then followed through with his statement by skating backward for about five yards before lifting a hard backhanded shot into the Ottawa net. The following season in 1915-1916 would see an NHA team recapture the Stanley Cup, as the Montreal Canadiens went on to win with the help of hot-tempered center Nuzi Lalonde and the calm and collected goaltender Georges Vesna. This would be the first of many championships to come for the Canadiens franchise. With World War I going on, a large number of hockey players left the rink in order to serve. In fact, in the 1916-1917 season, the Toronto 228th Battalion had so many former hockey players among its ranks that it was able to field a full team in the NHA that lasted for 10 games before they had to withdraw the team due to the men being shipped overseas. The 1916-1917 season also produced another first in the hockey world, a Stanley Cup championship won by United States team. Very few people today would be able to guess that the first U.S. team to win the Cup was not Detroit, Boston, Chicago, or even New York, but in fact the 1917 Seattle Metropolitans of the PCHA, who beat the defending champions, the Montreal Canadiens, in four games. Despite narrowing the number of professional leagues down to two and the less chaotic nature of the World Series system for winning the Stanley Cup, all was not well in the owners' boardrooms. The NHA owners had become disgruntled with one of their own, and in November of 1917, all of the owners, save for one that is, met at the Windsor Hotel in Montreal to create a new league. The National Hockey League. <laughs>